and we pray, Lord, that our hearts will receive everything you are sending, and it will do good in every life in Jesus' name. The power, the strength, the grace to preserve your word in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, all through to the end of our lives. Grant unto us in Jesus' name. Let the power of the word continue in every life, in every family, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 6. It talks about the unchangeable gospel, the unchangeable message, the unchangeable declaration, the unchangeable revelation that God had sent to man. God is unchanging. Christ is unchanging. His word is unchanging. And the message of salvation is unchanging. And because God has not changed in his demand of salvation and in his provision of salvation, that's why the past that leads to that salvation, the message that leads to that salvation, the declaration that leads to that uh, salvation, and the revelation that came from God leading to that salvation remains ever the same. The unchangeable gospel above all, above all apostles and angels, apostles here on earth, Apostles in the church, apostles at that time, apostles at this time, apostles at the end of time. Whoever those apostles are, the gospel is above them. The message of heaven is above them. The revelation from heaven is above all the apostles and above all the angels. So if the angels change, that will not change the gospel. If the apostles change, that will not change the gospel. If churches and denominations change, that will not change the gospel. And so the verses we're looking at today, verse 6, all through to verse 9, they are telling us that the gospel is still the same at their time, at our time, and at the time of the generations that will follow. That gospel remains unchangeable, unchanging. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 6. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the gospel, into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel. And then in verse 7, it says, which is not another, but there be some, some preachers, there be some some so-called apostles, there have been some, some people that say they have a new revelation, there have been some that trouble you and will pervert and will corrupt and will change and will modify and will mutilate and will adulterate the gospel of Christ. And then it says in verse 8, but though we we apostles or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed the apostle paul was so shown of the veracity and the truthfulness and the unchangeableness of the gospel that he said even though it's us that preach the gospel at the beginning, I will come back to you to change and to modify and to adulterate that gospel. Or maybe an angel from heaven appears to anyone in a vision, in a trance, in a dream, and tries to change and corrupt that gospel which we have preached already. He says, let him Apostle or angel be accursed. In verse 9, it says, And as we said before, so 
say I now again, if any man, any man of that generation, any man of this generation, any man of whatever stage, of whatever standing, of whatever status, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Those are the words of revelation that the apostle brings to us today, and we're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, number one, it tells us about the calling into the grace of Christ, the calling we have, the calling by the mercy of God, by the grace of God, by the love of God, by the compassion of God, the calling we have into the grace of Christ. Number two, our conservation of the gospel of Christ. The grace has come to us. The gospel has come to us. The message of life eternal has come to us. And we're to conserve that message. Conserve that gospel. Preserve the authenticity and the originality of that gospel. So that we can pass to the next generation without any mutilation or adulteration. The cons our conservation of the gospel of Christ. Number three now, our commitment to the gospel and to the glory of Christ. Our commitment. We want Christ glorified. He died. He suffered. He bought pain. He bought the shame and the agony of the death on the cross of Calvary. If there is anything we should bring to him, it should be glory in our lives, in our preaching, in our commitment, in everything we do every time we are committed, we must be committed to the glory of Christ. Let's come to number one. Number one is our calling into the grace of Christ. Our calling into the grace of Christ. Look at verse 6, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that he has also removed from him that called you, our calling, called you, our calling, into the grace of Christ, our calling into the grace of Christ. And then he said, they were now following another gospel. Three things here. Number one, conversion through the grace of Christ. Number two, corruption of the grace of Christ. Number three, confirmation of the grace of Christ. Number one, conversion through the grace of Christ. We're converted. We're transformed. Our lives are changed. Our lives are turned around because grace came into our lives. We came into the gospel through grace and the gospel through the grace of God worked in our lives and it brought conversion. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're justified, we're set free. He takes us the seed we have never seen because our sins were laid on Christ and His righteousness given unto us imputed unto us were justified were saved were set free were converted were renewed were transformed freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus look at verse 25 it says whom god has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood is the blood of christ that is shared as our substitute. 
in his death for us that has brought that salvation that conversion and then it says to declare his righteousness for the remission removal the cleansing the forgiveness of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God in verse 26 it says to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier the one that sets us free the justifier the liberator of him that believes in Jesus it tells us in chapter 4 verse 16 chapter 4 verse 16 therefore it is of faith this conversion it is of faith this salvation it is of faith this forgiveness it is of faith and this salvation conversion to the Lord it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not only that which is of the Lord the Old Testament people but to that also which is of faith of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all in verse 22 it says and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness is believing in the Lord is accepting the Lord is embracing the plan of salvation he embraced that and that was imputed unto him for righteousness verse 23 it says now it was not treating for his sake alone that it was imputed to him verse 24 but for us also for you also for everyone also for all those people that still need to be saved they need to know it was done for abraham his faith was counted unto him for righteousness and as we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ even today it says for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead verse 25 then tells us who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification romans chapter 5 reading from verse 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god set free forgiven and the Lord not counting any sin against us anymore because we believed in Christ. It says because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, it says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Whereby we came in by grace we abide in grace we are sustained by grace it says wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of god ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 it says for by grace are ye saved not by personal effort personal endeavor personal trial turning over a new leaf or maybe the works of the hand of man by grace, by grace, because Christ died and because Christ provided that salvation for us, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Let's come to number two now. Number two, corruption of the grace of Christ. There were Judaizers. There were Jewish people, they wanted to add their fleshly circumcision, the Jewish of the Jewish covenant, of the old covenant. They wanted to add that to the grace and the free and full salvation of the Lord. Whatever you add to the message of salvation, which is not in the original revelation of Christ 
and of the apostles concerning the salvation of the Lord, whatever you add will corrupt that gospel. And so as these people came and they were adding the circumcision of the Jews, the tradition of the Jews, the culture of the Jews, the outward expression of the Jewish life as they added that for salvation, for people to be saved, they corrupted the gospel of Christ. As you come from various backgrounds, in the backgrounds you came from, they might emphasize this, that background, and emphasize that, and emphasize that. When you add the emphasis of your old denomination, of your old religious life, of your old tradition, when you add that to the gospel of Christ, you corrupt the grace of Christ and the gospel of Christ. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, reading from verse 11, but we believe that through grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they We believe, Peter said, we believe, the Jewish um, apostles, they said, we believe that original panel that sat to determine what is included in the gospel of Christ. They concluded by saying, we believe that through grace and grace alone, grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we the Jews shall be saved, even as they the Gentiles, corruption. They came in and they brought corruption. Let's look at Jude, reading from verse 4. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in on a wares. The church was becoming large, like our church. And there are various house fellowships in many places and various church locations in many places and various churches in many local governments and regions and states and countries and then there will be people that creep in among the workers among the preachers and they do not hold and stand for only the gospel of the grace of god they bring in some other things that's corruption. It says there are certain men crept in unawares who were before ordained, that is, pre-reaching to this condemnation on godly men, turning the grace of our, of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the people that say that Christ is not enough. His death not sufficient. His suffering not sufficient. And the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for the salvation of everyone that comes to him. They say that's not sufficient. They must add their own petty kind of teaching and doctrine they came in now they deny the only lord god and our savior jesus christ we're told in second peter chapter 2 verse 1 it says but there were false prophets false preachers false teachers also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you there was there shall be. That's why we need to be on our guard every time. That's why we cannot just suck in everything that everybody says every time. We need to be aware of the fact that there were false prophets in those days, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them 
and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There is a consequence when people change the gospel, when they adulterate the gospel, when they corrupt the gospel. There is a consequence, there is judgment. It says in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Why? They're not reading the Bible for themselves. They're not thinking through on the word of God they hear by themselves. They do not have deep and full understanding of the gospel they have heard. And because of that, when these false prophets and false preachers who are adulterating the gospel, when they come, they follow them. Many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And then in verse 3, it tells us, and through covetousness shall they with faint words, hypocritical words, sugar-coated words, motivational words, make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the confirmation of the grace of Christ. Confirmation of the grace of Christ. How do we confirm the grace of Christ? That grace coming from God through Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The grace of God that comes to everyone because there's no impartiality with God. There is no respect of persons with God. He calls everyone. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Jesus was given a ransom for us that his will to save everyone that believes will be fulfilled. The confirmation of that grace of Christ in Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation that grace never comes empty handed the grace of God brings salvation as we're sitting there and the grace of God comes to you it brings salvation it brings transformation it brings a new life if any man be in Christ is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things have become new when the grace of God comes to you conversion comes transformation comes a new life comes a new creature a new nature comes for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, bring it. Even today, it's still bringing because there's still sinners in the world. And as those sinners hear the word of God, the grace of God will come to them. That grace has appeared to all men. That grace has appeared to all men. That's why you are here. And the grace of God is for you. And the goodness of God is for you. And the result of the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary is for you. It appeared unto all men. Now when it comes, look at what it does in verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, teaching us the grace of God comes into our lives and any dirty things that grace meets in our life, it'll wash it away. Any evil sin that that grace meets in our nature, it'll take it away because that grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All these things are not of God, they are of the world. And the world is passing away. 
and the lusts thereof. And whosoever doeth the will of God, he abides forever. That's what the grace of God comes and why it comes into our lives. It comes to confirm a new life, a new nature, a new character, a new disposition. A new direction in life teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly. No more frivolity, no more carelessness, no more gambling with life and gambling with eternal life. And there is no more foolish living and there's no more fleshly living. It says that grace now demands that we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This present evil world. This present licentious world. And this present Satan-controlled world. And this present tempting world. And this present polluted world we live soberly, righteously, godly, because that's what the grace of God has come to do in our lives. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. Here in purpose, who gave himself for us as the sacrificial lamb who gave himself for us as our substitute who gave himself for us to bear our pain our punishment and the consequence of our sin who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works i pray that will be a confirmation in every one of our lives in my life that will be the confirmation and you will live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world there'll be that confirmation in your life of the presence of the savior and the salvation in your life that you'll be redeemed from all iniquity and then you're purified and you have zeal for good things, the good things of the Lord. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. I identify with Christ. I come side by side with Christ. He lives in me and I live in him. And I, because of that salvation, and I, because of the conversion, and I, because of the confirmation of the grace of God in my life, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But I don't live the old life. I live the new, in newness of life. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's not in my strength. If you are living only by your strength, you cannot live to show, to confirm the righteousness and the salvation of the Lord. It says, not I. If you are living by human strength, human ability, no matter how strong your constitution may be, you cannot live the way he wants us to live as the Savior of the Redeemer lives within us. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ that overcame every temptation, Christ liveth in me. Christ the conqueror, Christ liveth in me. Christ the victorious one, and Christ that lived, and he said, the God of this world cometh and has nothing in me. That Christ, victorious, conquering, powerful, 
unconquerable that Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray it will be confirmed in every life. When you see somebody who is saved, when you see somebody who is really converted, when you see somebody that Calvary has affected his life, influenced his life, and he walks in this life, he walks straight, he walks in righteousness, he walks in the fact that Christ, the victorious and holy righteous one, lives on the inside of him, and the world will not conquer you. And the evil in the world will not pull you down. You will live victoriously in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Point number two is our conservation of the gospel of Christ. God wants what is given to us not to be thrown down robbed in the mud, mixed with the tradition of the world, mixed with false doctrine and false ideologies, mixed with all the precepts and the proposals of the things coming from the world. He wants each preserved pure as it came from heaven came to the apostles and the apostles were faithful and they delivered that gospel unto us it's come to us and we don't mix it with any of the deficiencies of the human life we preserve it and then it goes to other people preserved and pure the, our conservation of the gospel of Christ. Unfortunately, it wasn't like that with the Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert, pervert, pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8. It says, but though we one angel from heaven preach any other gospel, perverted gospel, corrupted gospel, modified gospel, adulterated gospel, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be a cause. Three things. Number one, perseverance in the preservation of his gospel. Number two, punishment for the perversion, perverters of the gospel. Number three, partakers of the power of the gospel. Number one, it's the perseverance in the preservation of his gospel, his gospel, his gospel. So that if God looks at the gospel you are preaching, he'll say, that's his gospel. If he looks at the gospel you are practicing, you are living by, he'll be able to say, that's his gospel, that there has been no change. It's his revelation. As he has given, so you are preserved it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. I declare the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein Yes, stand. Verse 2. What are the contents of that gospel? What are the 
itemized revelations in that gospel, verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us now the components of that gospel, the items of revelation in that gospel. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, I received, I delivered. I received, I didn't doctor it, tailor it, modify it, adulterate it, change it. I received, as I received, I delivered unto you. And it says, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Christ, the sinless one, the holy one, he died for the sinners in the world. All the sinners of every generation according to the scriptures. And then in verse 4, it tells us and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what I received. And as I received that unchangeable gospel, as I received that life-changing gospel, as I received the salvation-giving gospel, as I received that gospel from heaven that brings the life of heaven into the soul of man on earth, as I received, I preserved, I delivered unto you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. I have laid the foundation. He laid the foundation of the gospel. He laid the foundation with the gospel. He laid that foundation in the hearts of the people he preached to. He laid the foundation in all the churches he planted. He laid the foundation in all the churches he taught and edified. And he says now, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Let no one adulterate that gospel, modify that gospel, corrupt that gospel, turn upside down that gospel. Let the gospel remain the gospel. In verse 11, it says, For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then in verse 12, it says, Now, if any man, anywhere, build upon this foundation gold, precious message, uncontaminated message, a kind of message that comes directly without any change, and it comes to the heart of man, and it brings change transformation, salvation, real conversion, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, combustible material, destructible materials, light material, a kind of gospel that's like wood and hay stubble. That's what they are building and it doesn't affect life. It doesn't change life. There is no compelling power to turn that life around. Verse 13 tells us, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, but the day for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try, shall test, 
shall put to test every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14. If any man's work abide because of the pure gospel, unchanged gospel, life transforming gospel, soul converting gospel, because that's what he did, any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. I pray you receive a reward. I pray I will receive a reward. You receive in Jesus' name. Preserve the gospel. Let it remain precious, pure, without addition, without subtraction. Live it as it is. Preach it as it is, as it was delivered. Then your work will abide that you build thereupon and you receive a reward. Verse 15, in verse 15, and if any man's work be burnt, any man's work, a man who thinks is above that which is written, is a man of authority, a man of power, a man of self-will, and therefore I can change, I can moderate, I can add, I can subtract, I can change. And the gospel it preaches has no effect, has no power. It doesn't drive people to their knees to repent. The gospel he preaches has no convicting power. It doesn't remind them of the sins they have committed. They need to repent of. The gospel he preaches is a priest, a gospel that makes them joyful, laughing, hilarious in their sin. The gospel he preaches does not have any good character associated with it. It just, you know, superficial, hollow gospel. And that man's work cannot abide because it doesn't bring any soul to repentance, any soul to righteousness, any soul to newness of life. And so, even though he's a Christian by himself, but his work does not abide because he does not preserve the purity of the gospel. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We we'll come now to number two there. Number two is the punishment for the perversion of the gospel. The one who perverts the gospel, who turns the gospel upside down, the one whose preaching of the gospel does not include righteousness, does not include holiness, does not include a change of life, by grace, by grace, by grace. And the grace doesn't teach the people to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. What's the punishment for those people that water down the gospel? And they do not have the gospel in its purity, in its originality. And they pervert the gospel. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, it says, I marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, though we who preach the right gospel, the saving gospel in our younger years, now we are getting older and we have to befriend everybody 
and we're looking for the love of the people and their smile and the praise of man and they don't want sin mentioned so we we'll drop that they don't want repentance mentioned so we we'll drop that they don't want restitution mentioned so we we'll dropped that they don't want new life and the new character they don't want that mentioned so we we'll drop that and we we'll preach now a flattened gospel a gospel that doesn't even wash stain from even clothes not to talk of washing stain from the life of people and now we are just uh, happy preaching preaching uh, and all we say now god bless you god bless you they're living in sin god bless you they are backsliding god bless you they're putting the gospel of christ into the mud god bless you and they are adulterating the word of god and all we can say now as we are getting hold and anemic without any backbone anymore god bless you do we one angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed that's the danger and that is the punishment for the people who turn the gospel around and they do not have the backbone to stand for the gospel that the lord has given Look at chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're looking at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the angels of Christ. Then in verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15 now tells us, Therefore, it is no great sin if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Look at this. Whose end shall be according to their works. What do you want your end to be? You're a preacher of the gospel. The Lord has committed to your trust this saving gospel, life-changing gospel. How do you declare that gospel? Are you deceiving people? Are you blessing them in their sin? Are you encouraging them that they are saved and yet they remain sinners? Are you teaching them to deny Christ, to disobey Christ, to discredit Christ, to disregard Christ, and yet you are saying they are saved? It says, whose end shall be according to their works. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan gives some form of power to blindfold the people who are not living according to the gospel. They're preaching a false gospel, a watered-down gospel, an adulterated gospel. They're not faithful to the calling of God to preach the pure gospel and preserve it pure. And yet, some lying wonders take place. And yet, some signs and so-called power takes place. And people say, okay, if it's not preaching the right thing, if it's not towing the line that God likes, that God wants, why is miracle, healing, definite manifestation, lying wonders taking place? They don't understand. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They received not the love of the truth 
the truth that saves the truth that sets us free the truth that makes us hate sin hate sin in the private hate sin in the public and we will not have anything to do with anything sinful that's the love for the truth but these people do not have the love of the truth that they might be saved look at verse 11 in verse 11 and for this cause for this reason it says god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they should believe a lie that they should believe a lie do you believe a lie you go to a counselor and you say you are having this confusion and conviction a pain in your heart you stole money from your company some months some years ago now you want to make right with god we don't know when christ will come and you go to this counselor and you say i'm having this uh, conflict confusion in my mind uh, to return the money but i'm thinking i don't know what will happen if i return the money will they sack me will they just do whatever against me and the so-called counselor will say, don't worry about that. Just, just dismiss it. If there is that uh, pressure on your mind, you know, sing, do other things and all that, eventually all that conviction will vanish away. And you believe that. And you accept that. You know the Bible. You know the Word of God. You've heard it over and over from the Word of God that God, God requires that which is past. He wants you to make right your life. If you believe that lie of the counselor for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I will not believe a lie. I will not believe a lie. If you say it, God will help you. You will not believe a lie in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12. It says that they all might be damned. The counselor who, who modifies and all tricks the word of God, the counselee who accepts the adulteration of the word of God, that they all may be damned who believe not the truth, but add pleasure in unrighteousness let's look at number three here number three partakers of the power of the gospel the gospel has power when we receive the gospel without any modification we receive the gospel without any adulteration we receive the gospel without adding the thoughts of men and the ideas of men that gospel is mightily powerful in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 Romans chapter 1 verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation the gospel of Christ not modified not adulterated not changed coming as it is revealed from heaven and we receive that in our hearts and we meditate on that in our hearts and we take that gospel that message of the gospel we take it to the lord in prayer we say lord your gospel has come i accept i believe i embrace i want you to do everything you sent you to do in my life the power of god will work in your life it says for i'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the jew force and also to the greek and then he tells us in verse 17 for therein is the righteousness of 
God reveals. That gospel comes to you. It is thereby the righteousness of God will be confirmed in your life from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let me have a good amen there. The just, the justified. You come to the Lord and then the gospel comes to you and you receive it in total without any change. And then the Lord forgives your sin and the Lord takes away everything that you've done in the past that was wrong. And then he releases you to go and live in the power of the gospel and you live by faith you live a victorious life you live a conquering life and the sin that used to bring you down and rub your face on the mud before that sin will not have dominion over you anymore in jesus name it tells us in first thessalonians chapter one reading from verse five first thessalonians chapter one verse five for our gospel came not unto you in words only but also in power and in the holy ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes look at verse six it says in verse six and ye became followers of us and ye became followers of us the gospel came to them and the power of the gospel had effect in their lives and they became followers of the lives of the apostles and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 7. It says so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And you know, the Macedonians and the people of Achaia, they were saying, Look at them, they have changed. Look at them, they don't do that anymore. Look at them, their lives have turned around for the better. Look at them, there's a new life, there's a new disposition, and there's a new direction in their lives. Look at them, their lives are now now heavenly and progressive pure because the gospel had worked in their lives look at verse 8 for from for from you sounded out the word of the lord not only in macedonia and achaia but also in every place in your place of work in every place in your home in your family in every place in your community in every place that he is in the boss in the taxi in every place your life is now radiant radiant with the purity of the gospel and it says for your faith to god word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything and then in verse 9 it says for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you and how ye turn that's the power of the gospel it has the power to turn everyone ye turn to god from idols to serve the living and true God. And then in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I pray that such clear evidence of conversion, salvation, transformation will be seen and visible in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Point number three now. In point number three, our commitment to the glory of Christ. Our commitment to the glory of Christ. Now that we have received the gospel and we preserve the gospel, what's our life now? We're committed. We're committed. We're committed to the glory of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. As we said before, so say I now again. Think about that. If you say something 
before, you said something before, and after you said that, the Spirit of God came to you to say, why did you say that? That's not right. That's not the proper thing to say. You will not come back and say it again. If you did, you'll be a backslider. If you said something before by the gospel, for God's glory, as revealed from heaven, and then there were some people that didn't accept that, didn't take that in, I might even throw some stones of criticism at you because you said that. If you are fearful, if you are not looking up to God alone, if you're looking at the reactions of 